looking forward to Christmas, uh, going through the Old Testament prophecies about the virgin birth, about Jesus, our Savior being born uh, to, uh, to save us. And Isaiah 7 is where we are at today. Uh, in verses 13 and 14, I think this is the familiar one. Maybe not the first verse, but the one after, of course. Then Isaiah said, Hear now, you house of David. Is it not enough to try the patience of humans? Will you try the patience of my God also? Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son. And we'll call him Emmanuel. Uh, let's pray together. God, we thank you for your uh, never-changing, uh, but your life-giving word uh, you bring to us today. We thank you for your word that is alive and active. It speaks uh, straight to our moment, to, to our lives, to our hearts, uh, through the Holy Spirit. Uh, we thank you uh, for how you provide everything we need. And uh, even for me, as I bring your message, we thank you. For your grace and uh, help us to see what you're saying to us today and to live it out in Jesus' name, Amen. Uh, so, as we've seen with our with our series, a lot of the prophecies that we've looked at, uh, well, not all, not, not a lot of them, but a couple of them. Were, there's the, that's what's, what's called a dual uh, prophecy or a dual f- fulfillment. Uh, example is the one we looked at in Daniel. Daniel nine speaks of the this anointed this Messiah that's going to come bring the people back out of exile and in, into Jerusalem again. And we remember that was, in their context, King Cyrus, uh, King, King of Persia, uh, that allowed them to go back. And, but that was looking further ahead, uh, looking at Jesus, the Messiah, the true anointed one um, that God sent in a, in a, in a brought in the, in the cradle in Bethlehem uh, to save us, get us out of our exile, really, of sin, to be with God. Uh, so uh, today we look at a similar one, a, a, a dual fulfillment, uh, where it has, uh, it, it was fulfilled in that context, but also uh, that's, that was just kind of a picture of what God was going to do later uh, through Jesus. Uh, so today is what's going on is uh, the evil king Ahaz of Judah, uh, was about to, he's being besieged by the king of Israel and of Syria. They made an, made an alliance uh, against uh, Judah. And uh, Isaiah's telling him, this alliance is coming, but there's going to be a sign that is going to end one day. Uh, it says it about this baby, this, vir- this virgin is going to conceive, give birth, and they're going to call this baby Emmanuel. Um, this was a sign that, that that alliance against him would end one day. And uh, in that day, it wasn't a miraculous virgin birth, but that, that virgin would one day be married and her, her and her husband would have a baby. And around that time, it says, if we read further in the, uh, in the text, it talks about that baby is going to grow. And at the time where it's eating curds, uh, and also, when it knows the difference between right and wrong, uh, that's when that siege will end. Uh, now, what is that age? Now, we, we speak of the age of accountability, right? Uh, like when, whenever we, uh, maybe we had a, a child that's excited to get baptized, but we want to wait until they know what fully what's going on and fully their need for Jesus and what they're really getting into, right? Uh, so we wait to that age of accountability, uh, where, where they're aware and um, where they, where that age where God says, you know, now you're accountable for your own. So when you're younger, okay, you're, you're, you're ignorant, right? Uh, for example, if a baby dies or a kid dies, four-year-old, right? God's not going to say, oh, well, you, <laughs> you haven't made that commitment yet. Well, God, God's grace, he understands, uh, and they're under that, that grace. But that age of accountability, I, I, I believe it's Every child is different, of course, but I would say about 10, 11 years old. Uh, it could be more or less. But that's not what Isaiah is speaking of here. It's uh, that age when you start to realize that there are some things that are right and some things that are wrong. For example, uh, Jonathan, he's learning that right now. He knows there's, there's some things that he does 
there's going to be an application of the hand <laughs> to the bottom, right? And he is about <laughs> three years old. He's going to be three years old soon. So he's just starting to learn it. And that, um, believe it or not, that was how long until that siege ended? It was about three years later. Uh, so about that time where that child that was born uh, would have that time of knowing between right and wrong. Uh, and it was 732 B.C., uh, Tiglath Pileser III destroyed Damascus, and then afterwards uh, Aram put Rezin, king of Syria, to death, and Ahaz, king Ahaz of Judah, goes to Damascus and meets the Assyrian king there. You can read that in uh, 2 Kings 16, uh, verses 7 through 19. So that day came, and it was about three years uh, after Isaiah mentioned that seed's not going to, he says, not going to, that alliance is not going to last forever. It's going to end when that baby uh, gets of that age. Uh, and of course, when they looked at that baby, they, even though they were, especially Ahaz, he was an evil king. He didn't, he didn't do right in God's sight, but he, uh, despite that, we, he saw that God was still with them, that God took care of them. And every time they looked at that child, they said, God with us, right? Em- Emmanuel. Uh, so that is a dull fulfillment, but later on, the true <laughs> Emmanuel, the true God with us, God in the flesh, uh, Jesus, the Word made flesh, um, came, as we know, as we celebrate Christmas. Um, that complete and true fulfillment. It wasn't just a woman who was a virgin one day and then didn't be, you know, gave birth eventually and laid with her husband and gave birth. But no, this is a true virgin, uh, Mary, uh, a true miraculous virgin birth, uh, which was... A, over 700 years after Isaiah uh, shared this prophecy. Uh, and in that, we see the fulfillment of God's promise uh, to Israel as a whole, but also it's even connected to, the, to that, that, that one in the context that he gave to, he gave to Ahaz and king, to Judah. He says, uh, well, he read in verse 13, it doesn't say uh, necessarily to Judah, right? It doesn't say to Ahaz, but it says, House of David. Interesting how he would say House of David there. Uh, really, I say he's look, really looking forward to the true fulfillment, the true Emmanuel. Uh, but still, it's kind of a, uh, a promise that one day that line, uh, the line of Judah, the lion of Judah will come through the line of Judah. Uh, that one day the true fulfillment would be through that very line, through, uh, through Judah's line. Uh, and God, we saw that God being faithful to not just Judah, but it says the, the, the throne of David. Uh, listen, you, uh, those, the whole, all, all, all the people of God, that one day uh, that is going to happen where the true Emmanuel comes and through a true and uh, f- true virgin miraculous birth uh, as we look at today. And when, uh, when God did that, when God brought forth his son, born of a virgin, uh, Born, uh, not under the law, but born to, to redeem those that are under the law. This is not God coming in the flesh just to show off. To say, like, look, look at this miracle I can do. I can, I can come uh, through a virgin and bring the Messiah. But uh, and it's not even God emphasizing that first, that, that prophecy uh, of, of coming through a virgin birth. But it was actually necessary. God had it for us, the human race, to be saved uh, and to be, have a substitute for our sin. God in the flesh, it had to come through a virgin. Had to come through a human, but yet still be separate from the curse of what? Sin. Separate from the curse of sin and death because Jesus, to be our true atoning sacrifice, had to be without sin. And he was God in the in the flesh, and he, he didn't sin once, we know that, and that's how he was able to be our substitute. But this was necessary. It wasn't God showing off. Uh, it wasn't God put an exclamation mark on that prophecy, but it was needed. God had it planned before the age of time. Um, it says, not from the seed of a man, but from the seed of a woman, that the Messiah would come, uh, the perfect human substitute. God could, I mean, he could, could have, he could have created a whole new race. He could have created a new Adam, right? 
Uh, but he, I mean, nothing to us because it's not connected to our race where we need uh, our specific human race. Uh, Jesus had to come from that, fr- that, that first, the seed of a woman, to be our tr- true atoning uh, sacrifice. It, he could have just, like Adam, taken the dust of the earth, right? But he didn't do that. And it's, it's interesting why Eve was taken out of Adam, right? So there wouldn't be two separate races, all right? Uh, she was taken from, uh, from Adam. Uh, but why uh, aren't the men involved here? Why, why not the seed of a man? It's the seed of a woman. Well, there is a study, uh, Dr. Uh, his name's Dr. Duhon. He was a uh, medical doctor and a, and a theologian. Uh, but he, 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 he said that men are the carriers, <laughs> Uh, of, the, of the sin DNA that gets passed along, it's the guys uh, through their blood that it, it gets passed on to, to everyone else. Uh, but God made it in a way where through the woman, uh, God could take part, part of Mary and part of who else? God, right? And, and have the second Adam. Jesus can be our substitute but still be without sin. So this was necessary uh, this is God making a way out. Uh, the mirac- not just showing off with a miraculous virgin birth, but this is, this is completely necessary for Jesus to be our, to be our Savior. It's not the seed of God and the seed of woman to be joined together to be our Savior. And, and Mary wasn't a surrogate mother. It was actually part of who she was. Uh, and, and the Holy Spirit uh, conceived in her and, of course, we know gave birth to Jesus. Um, Bible never says, like I said, the Messiah would come through the seed of a man, but the seed of a woman, specifically. You, we look at uh, Jesus' genealogies. There's uh, two in the Bible, right? Uh, where are they found? Matthew, where's the other one at? Luke. That one's a little harder to find. Uh, it's after Jesus' baptism. Uh, okay, so uh, in Luke, we see uh, it's connected to Adam. I'm sorry, excuse me, Joseph. Uh, speaks of, it ends with Joseph, but not because of the biological genealogy, but because it is, anytime someone became king, right, they had to do what? Show their king, their lineage, right? That they came from, not, not like Herod, right? Herod didn't really come from a king. He just, <laughs> he made it look like that. Uh, but this is legally, uh, so to show that Jesus was a legal and legitimate Era of the throne, right? The throne of David. Uh, so that's Luke. And it ends with Joseph. Of course, which one do you think Matthew ends with? Mary. And we know women often were never even put in genealogies, right? It is to highlight uh, that, it, that this is the biological uh, genealogy. Jesus came through the seed of, of Mary, of a, of a, of a woman. Now, in Isaiah and uh, in Judah's context, uh, when it spoke of that virgin who would eventually conceive and give birth, uh, that was the sole purpose. When that baby would grow up, they saw it. They would be reminded of God's faithfulness and that God was with them and, and his timing, his timing. Uh, now, the greater and true fulfillment was the greater and truer need uh, through a true virgin, like, like I said, the miraculous birth through, through Mary. Um, and no one needed to hear this more, that it was God that was conceived, uh, that the Holy Spirit came. Who needed to hear that the most? In that time, Joseph. Guys, if you're about to get married and your wife was pregnant, what are you thinking? We're done, right? Marriage off. Well, that's what Joseph thought. And he was such a noble man, he didn't react in emotion. He could have said, May she get stoned, right? May she be stoned to death for, uh, for adultery, right? Uh, or for, even, for lying even. Well, he was such a noble man, he, he wanted to divorce her. How? Quietly. He didn't want anybody to know, and he loved her. He, truly, he, he really loved her. So he, he was going to divorce her quietly without anybody knowing about it, without her facing the risk of getting stoned by the community. Uh, but thankfully, God stepped in. And he sends an angel. It doesn't say which angel it was, but it was an angel um, who spoke the right thing at the right time, right? To the right, 
right dream, I guess you may say. Now, we fail pretty good at communication, don't we? Almost daily, we miscommunicate with one another. Uh, the exa- there's an example of a train conductor driving his train down the tracks and a sign of, <laughs> there's construction on this bridge you don't want to take a train on. Uh, we feel some of our miscommunication can be lethal. Uh, but thankfully, God spoke here the right thing at the right time through the right messenger in the angel. Joseph needed to hear it from an angel. Uh, I'm sure and after he did, big sigh of relief. Huge sigh of relief. And he really wanted to marry Mary. <laughs> uh, and so he gets married. Uh, he stays with Mary. Uh, and think about it. If it, took, it took an angel to do what was most important and, and unbelievable. That unbelievable announcement. Think about it. Never heard of a virgin birth before. <laughs> Uh, but thankfully, God brought the right person at the right time to say the right thing. Uh, and the same thing with Mary. Ladies, what if God came to you in a dream uh, and told you something unbelievable like that, right? Mary needed to hurt. And what was her response when Gabriel said, you're, you're going to conceive and you're going to give birth uh, to the Messiah, the Son of God? Because it comes from, because he came from God. He's part of God. He is the Son of God in, in the flesh. Uh, what was Mary's response? It was a question. Yes. How would this be? How, how would this be? I'm still a virgin. Um, and Gabriel says, just like anything God puts in front of us that we're not ready for, that we don't, we've never seen before, uh, that we may call impossible even, the, the answer was the Holy Spirit. <laughs> the Holy Spirit is always the answer uh, uh, for us to, to go where God calls us to go. That seems impossible or it's something we, didn't, uh, we never even experienced before. We look uh, all throughout Scripture. Oh, let's say if, if someone actually, if I came up to you and I said, Prove to me that you're a faithful, committed follower of Jesus. And you made a list of things to show me that you are a faithful, committed follower of Jesus. Now, what are some of those things you might put on the list to try to convince me? Um, Maybe you would say, confess Jesus before others uh, boldly, right? I have, uh, I've read my Bible and I meditate on it even daily, I've been faithful in prayer, faithfully attended uh, church and Bible study and service projects, faithfully uh, served the Lord on a regular basis. I've witnessed even the unbelieving friends and family help the poor. I've had uh, faithfully tithed my resources and even beyond that. Uh, but this one thing, I don't think many of us would put it on, on the list, to show that we have Committed to Jesus. We are faithful and committed follower to Jesus. Uh, what might it be? Well, it's something that, uh, that's entertained. Uh, not speaking of, in he- Hebrews 13, it says you've entertained angels not even knowing it, right? No, I'm talking about entertaining this thing, doubt. Doubt. Uh, we look all throughout the Bible and all throughout God's faithful servants, 99% of them, Doubted God. They doubted what God was doing. Let me give some examples here. Abraham and Sarah. Abraham and Sarah, God said, you're going to have the son of promise, right? Uh, and you're going to go in the promised land as well, but you're going to have the son of promise uh, who's going to bless all the nations. All the nations will be blessed through. And it took many years for that to come. And in the long wait, they showed some doubt, didn't they? And Sarah even did what? She laughed. Remember, Sarah laughed when, uh, when the angel said, you're going to get birth. She's like, what? Uh, nine some years old, I'm not getting any birth. You can go ahead. But <laughs> She laughed. That, she doubted the miracle. Uh, and then Moses, uh, what did he doubt? He doubted that God can give him the words to speak, right? This is the one that turned his staff into a, sti- into a snake and back, right? Uh, he doubted God could give him the words to speak. Gideon. 
uh, Gideon doubted uh, that God could help him defeat the Midianites. Uh, we know that he asked for a fleece, not once, but twice. Uh, he said, oh, this day, leave it all wet. Every day, leave it all dry, just so I know. Uh, he, he doubted. Uh, Elijah. Think about it. Elijah. This is a great man of God uh, who, who, j- who just got done uh, bringing fire from heaven to burn up a sacrifice, drenched with water, uh, and seeing God do many, many miracles through his life. Uh, he doubts that one moment when Jezebel wants to take his life, he doubts God can protect him. And so he wallows in uh, depression, and, and God came in, and of course we know he sent an angel and some bread and some, gave him some rest, uh, help him get back. But anyhow, Elijah doubted. Uh, Twelve apostles, let's go to the New Testament. The Twelve apostles, let's think of first off uh, the famous one for doubting. Who's that? Doubting Thomas. Thomas is his middle name, right? Doubting Thomas. Uh, he's like, well, not until I feel uh, the holes in his hands that feel where the spirit went in his side that I will know that he's resurrected. Right? Jesus did it for him, though. Uh, but he doubted uh, Peter. Uh, of course, a couple times when he began to sink, right? He had the faith and trusted Jesus to walk on water, but the moment he turned away from him, he started to doubt, and he sank like a rock. Uh, and also when he denied Jesus three times, right? Uh, John the Baptist, the great prophet John the Baptist, where Jesus said, there's no one other like him, no other prophet like him. He doubted. Where did he doubt? Uh, I mean, think about this. This is John who saw the Holy Spirit <laughs> descend like a dove as he's baptizing Jesus. And he heard the voice of the Father say, this is my son, who I am well pleased with. He still had a moment of doubt. Uh, When he was in prison, right, by Herod, uh, he doubted that Jesus was the true Messiah, right? Uh, He wasn't what he expected, really. But but John, he doubted. Uh, Many followers, and even as we see, many committed followers in the Bible, leaders, doubted God. Uh, Why? Well, if we're going to follow the God of the miraculous, the God of miracles, uh, who who does more than we can even ask, think, or even imagine, there's going to be times we're going to doubt how how he comes through with those miracles, right? If I'm truly following, there's going to be times where I need to trust him in faith that he can do it what he's calling me to do. Um, there, if I'm really growing in the faith, there's going to be times where I'm going to be stretched. There's going to be times where I need to have some fear of what God's, uh, how God's going to come through. Uh, and that, but that fear needs to grow into faith, right? Let me ask you, would, would you, uh, you want to worship a God that you totally understood? Would you? He totally get what he's all, always up to. Uh, would he be worthy of worship if I could fully figure God out? Uh, how the supernatural breaks into the natural. Uh, psychologists say this one emotion plays a very important ha- uh, role in bolstering our happiness, health, even social interactions, uh, even helping us cooperate with, with one another. This one emotion... Uh, do you know what it is? The emotion of awe. We don't quite think of that as an emotion too often, but it's an emotion. The emotion of awe, the feeling of awe. Uh, the definition they give is uh, something, the, the feeling you get after seeing something new or novel that doesn't fit your current understanding of the world. And if I'm following the one who is supernatural, <laughs> Uh, there's going to be times where I'm not quite understanding what he's going up to. And, but as I trust him in faith, I'm in awe. And if, uh, if I don't continue in faith, life is awful, right? But if I go where he says and i got to take the step of faith and go there and go through the doubts, I'll be in awe of him. You want more awe of God? Uh, I'm not saying to test God, but go where he's calling you to go. Uh, 
Maybe it's just simply something in his word he's calling out of you, right? That you've been trusting him for too long. But you want all of God. Let me tell you, before that all comes, there's probably going to be some fear. And there's going to be some doubt, right? Uh, if we uh, not just want to sing or even hear Emmanuel, but if we want to know Emmanuel, if we want to know God is with us, uh, Mary found that out, and those found that out, and Jesus, the true, the word in the flesh, they found out after all the fears, right, and after all the doubts, uh, they found out that, yeah, Emmanuel, this is God with us. Uh, but for us, for you and I, if we want to not just sing it, hear it, uh, or read it, but we want to know it, that God is with us, uh, there's going to be times where I'm going to have to wrestle through some doubt, because God's going to be calling me to, to be stretched um, there's a, a very famous prayer, probably the most famous prayer ever prayed is, uh, thy will be changed. God, thy will be changed. But Mary, when Emmanuel came, uh, when she heard the news and she went, got through her doubts, uh, what did she say? Basically, God's will be done. I am the Lord's servant. That's where we need to be. If we want to have a better understanding of God with us, not if, but when those times come as we're being stretched and uh, God's uh, showing us that he's the God of the supernatural. His ways are beyond tracing out. Uh, we, go from not, we go from religion uh, to relationship and knowing God is with us, seeing, going through those fears, going through the doubts and seeing and proclaiming that he is with us, not just reading it or hearing it, but knowing it uh, as, he, as we move forward in faith. Uh, I'll go ahead and pray, and then we're going to have a time of invitation. Maybe it's your first time to, to make that decision. I, trust Jesus? What? <laughs> I, I've trusted this thing my own, my own way my whole life. Maybe it's an opportunity it's an opportunity for you to come forward and confess Jesus before others and join him in the waters of baptism and die to yourself, being raised in newness of life. Let's uh, pray together. God, we thank you. Uh, we, we are, are re reminded once again that you are faithful to your word. Uh, your word given centuries before Jesus came, that the one would come born of a virgin uh, and would be Emmanuel, God with us, God in the flesh. God, help us uh, to grow in that knowledge of that, you, that you are with us, uh, the knowledge of, and the, the growing the grace and the knowledge of God, and to know that you are with us as we uh, move forward and trust you in the things uh, that we don't quite understand yet. We thank you for your goodness and your patience uh, with us uh, through our doubts. We pray in Jesus' name.